Hi Year 12, welcome to our religious in-depth study of Islam. This video will focus on exploring ethics, in particular bioethics. Firstly, let's look to the syllabus documents in order to identify what we actually need to learn and be able to do. The syllabus states that you will need to be able to describe and explain Islamic ethical teachings on bioethics. Now, if we break this down, describe means provide characteristics and features. So you're looking at providing the characteristics of Islam ethical teachings. Now, Islamic ethical teachings refer to the jurisprudence process and in doing so you will look at the Quran, the Sunnah and Hadith as well as Ijma and Qiyas. Now you will also be required to explain that is to relate cause and effect, make relationships between things evident, provide why and or how. So you'll be looking to how or the impact of Islamic ethical teachings on bioethics, so how they relate to one another. And remember that bioethics is just a branch of ethics that is concerned with medical and science issues. Now we choose to focus on abortion and euthanasia. Let's begin by revising what is meant by the term ethics. Ethics is essentially a religious reflection on a system of moral beliefs and practices. So this means that it clarifies what is right or wrong and essentially it is a guide for behaviour. Now if we're looking more specifically at bioethics, then we are looking at what is considered right or wrong in relation to medical or scientific issues such as abortion and euthanasia. Now abortion, just as a reminder, is the surgical removal of an embryo or fetus from the uterus in order to end a pregnancy. Okay, so that's a deliberate end to pregnancy. Euthanasia is the assisted act of helping someone die painlessly. Okay, so making that decision to assist someone to die. Alright, so these two medical issues that we will be focusing on requires an adherent to make a choice. For this reason, we will need to explore where adherents find guidance in order to make such decisions. Firstly, let's look at the role of human beings. As they are the ones making the decision, they become the most important component within ethics. Now, in Islam, there are important ethical teachings regarding human capacity for goodness. A human being has been honoured with goodness, in that we are created with the innate capability to recognise goodness and virtue, that is, what is right. A human being is created in the best composition, in that we have the capacity to excel in our humanity. And the Quran says that only those who believe and do good deeds will realise this potential. Thirdly, a human being is created as a caretaker on the earth, charged with the duty of upholding goodness and righteousness. That is, to do good things not only for ourselves, but, but for others. Human beings have been given the trust, which is self-awareness and freedom of choice that comes with it. The ability to reason and to be capable of recognising goodness and choosing it. Now the human being also has nafs, which is the egotistical soul that acts as the interface between the spirit and the physical body. All human evil is a product of, of the unpurified nafs. Now, because of these things, options for good and evil are apparent or possible. So what this means is that human beings have the ability to recognise goodness and strive to uphold what is right, but our choices can be negatively influenced by the emotions, desires and the selfish impulses of the nafs. Human action and behaviour can be divided into categories. The Quran outlines the actions that are self-evidently good, such as integrity, selflessness, charity and saving lives, as well as those that are self-evidently evil. 
such as murder, pedophilia, and torture. Now, it is within the broad grey area of good and evil where human nafs can interfere with our common sense and reason. It is for this reason that an independent source is needed to guide an adherent towards goodness. Firstly, we have the Quran and its practical implementation, as well as the Sunnah and Hadith, which is the words and actions of Muhammad. We also have the Qiyas, which is analogical reasoning, and Ijma, which are two fundamental sources that help Muslims to deal with the new and emerging issues of law and ethics. These can include our bioethical issues of abortion and euthanasia. Islamic bioethics is linked directly to Sharia law, which is the moral code and law for Islam. It is the primary source for guidance on ethical issues in Islam. Now, the sources of Sharia include the Quran, the Hadith and Sunnah, as well as the Five Pillars. The first source of guidance is the Quran, which is the word of God that was dictated to Muhammad by the angel Gabriel. It is a source book of Islamic principles and values. The Quran is considered to be the source of God's revelation, and guidance is presented in the Quran as it emphasizes the importance of saving life, supporting humanity, and preventing illness. The Quran is the first source which Muslims will look to in order to provide guidance for their life. The second source of guidance that Muslims will refer to when seeking guidance is the Hadith and Sunnah. The Hadith is the words of Muhammad himself, and he is considered the model of Muslims' life, so adherents will follow what he says when seeking guidance for various issues. The Sunnah is the behaviour of Muhammad. It is very helpful when it comes to decision making as it includes things he did and the things he did not object to. Some key quotes that you may refer to when looking at this uh, Hadith and Sunnah. If you should quarrel over anything, refer it to God and the Messenger. Okay, so that's just emphasising the importance of both the Quran, Hadith and Sunnah when attempting to make decisions. And in God's messenger, you have a fire model for anyone whose hope is in God and the last day. Again, reinforcing Muhammad as a model for Muslim life. So if you follow his words and his actions, then you will be rewarded in the afterlife. The five pillars are also important because essentially they provide instructions on behavior. Okay, and what this means is it can enforce what Muslims should or should not do. So, all of these sources teach the Islamic way of life, the importance of faith, and through the teachings address bioethical issues including abortion and euthanasia. Now, these sources helped an adherent to determine what is halal, or permitted, or haram, prohibited. Okay, but what if these sources do not really help in this particular situation? Firstly, Islamic adherents will rely on the Quran teachings. And if there is no reference, then they shall follow the Hadith and Sunnah. Okay, but if they are still unsure, they will then resort to the opinions of Islamic jurists, who use independent judgment to come up with a new ruling. This is what we call the process of jurisprudence, or fiqh. It is an expansion on the Sharia Islamic law. It is based on the Quran and Hadith and Sunnah, and it complements Sharia with evolving rulings or interpretations of Islamic jurists, who are experts in or writers of the law. Okay, uh, Jurisprudence process is necessary because it focuses on that grey area of human behaviour that was mentioned earlier. Okay, so those areas that are not identified strictly by the Quran, Hadith or Sunnah as being self-evidently good or self-evidently evil. And the jurisprudence process is applied with in relation to new issues and bioethical issues such as abortion and euthanasia. So as part of the, of the jurisprudence process, new sources become available. The first one is known as Kiyas, or analogical reasoning. 
Now, within this source, scholars use their reasoning to search for a parallel in the Quran, Hadith, and Sunnah. The key here is to discover why things are right or wrong, and then if a similar cause is identified in a new situation, then the ruling is extended to resolve the matter. So, for example, Islam prohibits the drinking of wine. From this, a broad prohibition of alcohol is deduced. The root cause here is the mind-altering nature of alcoholic drinks. Now, within this source, jurists uh, also use their reason, which is based on custom, public interest, and, equ and equity, to come up with a legal deduction. Okay, so they take into consideration the context and impact of such decisions. Now, the fourth source is ishma, or consensus, and this draws on decisions from renowned scholars from history. They reflect a consensus of understanding by authorities in Islamic law. So if a majority of, ex of scholars agree in a, on a situation over the same issue, then the likelihood of the solution being right greatly increases. Okay, so what this means is that um, if scholars repeatedly come to the same conclusion that something is right or wrong, then that becomes sort of enforced as the right action. Now, the individual, as mentioned earlier, is extremely important. The human being is the most important component or agent in ethical decision-making. All right, now, within Islam, there is a recognition that human action has consequences, not only for the individual themselves, but also for other people. Now, Islam lays responsibility on the individual whose conscience becomes a compass for right and wrong. Okay, so that belief that a human being can recognize goodness and strive to achieve it. Now, Islam's emphasis in believing in an all-knowing God and a trial in the afterlife motivates Muslims to do the right thing, as good deeds are directly linked to human salvation. The Quran and all Islamic ethical teachings strongly believe in the sanctity of life which is explained throughout the Quran, stating, Whoever has spared the life of a soul, it is as though he has spared the life of all people. And, do not take life which Allah made sacred, other than in the course of justice. These work to establish a basis of Islamic ethical teachings, attitude, and give the adherents a sense of what they should and should not be doing according to Allah. These sources are significant as they act as a guide in Islamic person's decision-making process throughout their life. Okay, so what does Islam say about abortion? Now, abortion, as we know, is the surgical removal of an embryo or fetus from the uterus in order to end a pregnancy. Now, in relation to Islam, the fetus is considered a creation of God. No one but the Creator has a right to take that life. For this reason, abortion is considered haram, or forbidden. A key quote you may refer to in relation to this is, and kill not your children for fear of poverty. Right. Now, are there any particular situations where abortion is permitted? Islam recognises two circumstances. Firstly, where the mother's life is at risk, or where the pregnancy is a result of rape. Now, within these situations and only these situations, abortion is um, permissible only if or before the fetus has a soul or ra. Okay? Now, this can happen at three possible stages depending on the variant. It may occur at 40 days where there is a possibility of the infusion of the soul or at 120 days, where there is definitely an infusion of the soul at this stage, or when the mother feels movement. Okay, so abortion is considered wrong it, all the time, but within these particular situations, if one or one of the above has occurred, then abortion is not permissible. Okay, so if we just quickly revise uh, this a little bit, uh, within Islam, we've got the key variants of Sunni and Shiite. Now, both of these variants uh, teach that abortion is permissible until 120 days, but only if there is a reasonable justification for why an abortion is being sought. Now, the situations 
obviously or if a mother's life is at risk or if anything occurs that could prevent the child from having a normal life okay now the reason why the mother's life is considered um, reasonable justification is because saving the mother is a lesser of the two evils okay and the mother is seen as the originator of the fetus so if she dies then the fetus dies as well okay now again the key quote that you may throw in when discussing uh, abortion is kill not your offspring for fear of poverty it is we who provide for them and for you surely killing them is a great sin okay so what you're looking at here is the idea that you shall not kill your child for fear of not being able to provide for them um, so that is not a reasonable excuse for wanting an abortion. Now, it is we who provide for them and for you is the idea of the Islamic community working together and living together. And this can also be seen in the uh, fourth pillar, uh, Zakat, which is uh, the poor tax, to put it simply. Okay, so the surely killing them is a great sin is reinforcing the idea that abortion is morally unacceptable. Okay, so what about euthanasia? Alright, so a reminder, euthanasia is the assisted act of helping someone die painlessly. And there are two types of euthanasia, passive and active. Active euthanasia involves administering a lethal amount of drug in order to bring about a person's death more quickly when the dying person has asked for it. On the other hand, passive euthanasia involves the withdrawal of life support systems considered to be an extraordinary mean of keeping one alive. And this is because sustaining life through ex extraordinary means is not the natural progression of life. Okay, and in a sense, you could draw similarities to uh, the idea of natural law explored in Christianity in relation to the Catholic denomination. Okay, according to Islamic teaching, life is a divine trust and must not be ended by either active or passive intervention as it shows a lack of trust in Allah and his plan for every member of his creation. Okay, life is given by Allah and it is his to take back at the appointed time. For this reason, euthanasia is considered forbidden in both the Quran and the Hadith. Some key quotes that you may refer to when looking at euthanasia is do not take life which Allah made sacred other than in the course of justice. When their time comes, they cannot delay it for a single hour, nor can they bring it forward by a single hour. Okay, this particular quote reinforces the powerful nature of Allah and that it is his authority only to decide when a person's life is to end. Okay, now if we look at um, any circumstances where euthanasia is considered okay, and again, there are two situations. The first, administering medicine that may shorten a patient's life to relieve pain or withdraw useless treatment to allow death to take its natural course. If a patient is medically presumed dead, switching off the life support may be permissible as a life support machine is no use for the already dead patient and organ donation could save another person's life. Okay, so the both variants uh, follow the same teachings in relation to euthanasia in identifying that it is not permissible because at the end of the day it comes down to killing another, be uh, another human being and this goes against the sanctity of life. Okay, so that wraps up our study of uh, Islam and bioethical issues of abortion and euthanasia. So just remember, in order to achieve the syllabus outcome, you're looking at the ethical teachings and guidance provided to um, Muslims, so the Quran, Hadith and Sunnah, and the jurisprudence process where they seek um, advice or guidance from Kiyas and Ijma and how these are applied uh, in order to help Islamic adherents in the decision-making process in relation to issues such as euthanasia and abortion. Do not forget 
to refer to quotes as support. Thanks.